Uh, I am, my name is Ron. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and I just want to start off by saying Happy Mother's Day. Uh, moms, I think I've said this in the past, I think you have the hardest job in the world. Um, if you're a mom, I, I just want to share that with you. And if you are a son or a daughter, I would want you to have that lens today as you reach out to your mom and say, hey, thanks, mom, because we uh, moms are incredible. So happy Mother's Day, moms. And uh, the rest of us, let's do our bit to honor them today. So if you were with us, <clears throat> and this is your first time, we are going to continue the study of the gospel, the book of John, where we are looking at the grace and truth of Jesus, the grace and truth that is found in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The term that we're going to continue to look at is Jesus as our Messiah. And I want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles, if you would open it uh, to chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 31 through 47. Also, I think last week we started those little gospel books out front. Man, they're a great little tool as well. If you, you can pick those up, I think they're for five bucks. You can take notes in those as well. I'd encourage you to do that. But what we're going to do this morning, and it's a continuation of this discourse that Jesus is having with the religious leaders, and who by their own choice and their own demise chose not to accept Jesus as Messiah, not to choose Jesus as deity. And we find out right now these guys are really, really mad. In fact, last week we looked at how Jesus raised this guy who couldn't walk, said, get up your mat and walk, and Jesus healed him miraculously. Wouldn't that be cool to start seeing that stuff again? Uh, and Jesus is working, and we're going to get to that pretty soon as well. But these guys are so angry now that they're out for blood. And what's amazing that we're going to look at real soon is how Jesus, knowing that they're out for blood, they want to take his life how he steps in with grace and truth as we see his heart for the religious people, for Israel. He still, he still has that. The full disclosure, as I'm reading, sometimes when you read the Bible, you're like, you identify more with the heroes than you do the bad guys. Anybody else like that? I'm like that. So in, in full disclosure, there were times in my life when my first reaction to these religious leaders was one of self-righteousness, of judgment, I mean, what's wrong with these guys? How could they respond to Jesus this way? What's wrong with them? They were raised studying the Bible, memorizing the Bible, teaching the Bible. What knuckleheads? And that's being kind. Not me. You see, I'd be more like Peter. I can relate to Peter. Why? Because he has a big mouth, thinks without speaking? Absolutely. Or James and John bringing down the thunder, and it's awesome. I'm more like them. I would have been one of the 12. For sure, 100%, I'd have been one of the 12. But then something happened. You see, the more time I spend in the Word, the more time I worship, the more time I pray and meditate, the more time I spend in community, God began to work in my heart. And I can no longer stand here and say, I can't judge them. Because now I, I find out that I relate to them. I get them. I know why they're thinking that way. You see, God is like saying, Ryan, there's days that you relate more like the religious leaders in our relationship than you think you're one of the 12. And that's okay because you need me as your Messiah and your Savior. And then God in his loving high kindness and goodness says, Ryan, can I show you your pride? Can I show you your wrong expectations and your self-righteousness? And so now I come to the Bible with a lens of humility dependence, longing to be with Jesus and to know him, realizing, realizing that I need a Savior, just not for eternity, but for today. I need him every day in my thoughts, in my work, and in my relationships, and so do you. So I want to encourage you. Let's look at the Bible today and see what Jesus has in store for you. We're going to break this passage into two sections. We're going to begin with chapter uh, 5, verse 31. If you have your Bibles, please follow along with me. John records this. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies about me, and I know that the testimony he gives about me is true. You sent messengers to John, and he testified to the truth. I don't need human testimony, but I say these things so that you, religious leaders, so that you may be saved. You see, John was a burning and shining lamp. And you were really willing to rejoice for a while in his light. 
But I have a greater testimony than John's because of the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I am doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. The Father who sent me has himself testified about me. You have not heard his voice at any time, and you have not seen his form. And you do not have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. Now, what's amazing here is we witness Jesus continuing this discourse and this, this conversation with the religious leaders who keep in mind they're circling for blood. They're, 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 wanting to kill, they're ready to kill him. And we see these two amazing things come out of Jesus. First of all, it's this longing that he has in his heart. It's the same longing that his father has in his heart for, the, for Israel, for these religious leaders. He longs for them to know who he is. We see this in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. 37, Matthew 23. Jesus says this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who sent her. How often I wanted to gather you children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Isn't that amazing? They're coming out for blood and God the Father's heart and Jesus' heart is still like, can I gather you guys up? I want you. I want to protect you. I want you around me. I want you to know who I am. But they didn't want him. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to continue to minister, reach out to you in your own thought. Because Jesus knew they were educated. He knew how they thought. He goes, you know what? I, I, I get that. So I'm going to come down to your level one more time and speak to you, hopefully, as you are thinking. And we see this in Deuteronomy 19.15. Jesus reminds them, one witness cannot, bear, cannot establish an iniquity or a sin against a person. Whatever that person has done, a fact must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Which brings us back to some testimonies that are going to point to Jesus as Messiah. And hopefully, his heart is that they would see this and accept this, but we already know they will reject it. So we're going to look at some of these, these testimonies that point to Jesus. So I'm going to invite you. Let's, let's pretend we're out cruising on Mother's Day. We're all in the car, the van. Do you guys drive vans anymore? Are, are vans still made? All right. Well, let's, let's pretend we're all on a family trip on all motorcycles. How's that sound? There we go. Yeah. Let's stretch moms today and some of you dads. Kids will love it. But we're traveling down this road towards Jesus, and there's going to be a lot of signs that are pointing to Jesus as Messiah. And the first sign we're going to come to is this. The first sign is the life and testimony of John the Baptist. Let's look at this. Verse 33 in John chapter 5. Jesus again says, You sent messengers to John, and he testified to the truth. I don't receive the human testimony, but these things... I say because so that you may be saved. John was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. You see, when, they, when Jesus first came on, they, the, even the religious leaders were getting all excited. They were excited. Messiah's here. Something's going to happen. But then the reality came in, and Jesus started doing and saying things that they didn't like. So their expectations didn't meet the outcome of what was going to happen. Let me share it to you a little bit like this. You ever follow a sports team in the summertime, and they're looking good, and then they're looking good in the fall, and all of a sudden they get to the Super Bowl, and they lose? <laughs> Is that too soon? I, you get it, don't you? You have expectations of the way things are going to happen. And when the reality hits, you're like... Nah. And we can discuss a whole other sermon on Philly fans, but we're not going to do that today. But we will look at when someone doesn't measure up to what you think should happen, how it impacts us. How it impacts us. Correct? Even kids. Remember when you were young and you couldn't wait to get out of your parents' house? Said, I can't wait for the day that I graduate from high school or college. I don't have mom and dad over top of me. Anymore. I can be my own person. And then you get out there and realize how much mom and dad really carried and I'm not talking just financial stuff, but we can start there. Let's talk about planning dinners. Let's talk about 
Who's putting gas in the car? Oh, by the way, when you drive a car, you know you have to have insurance. What about paying your rent? What about renter's insurance? What about the thing we never like to think about all the time is the weight and responsibilities that come with it. You're like, I'm so anxious to get out and be on my own. But then one day you wake up and realize how much headspace, how much responsibility that your parents carried every day. I think if you knew that from the get-go, we would still be at home with mom and dad. But we're not. So these misplaced expectations, I get it. And so this is why I can relate to the, to the religious leaders at times. Like, you know what, Jesus, you're not who I thought I, I wanted. And we still struggle with that today, don't we? There's parts of Jesus as Messiah that we like and parts that we don't. I like the idea where I can come and ask Jesus, my Lord and Savior, for eternal life. But that everyday thing where Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus lives in me. That's hard. Amen. So I can relate sometimes that Jesus, the Messiah that I see in Scripture, it's like... That's hard. And then some days, if I'm, I'm honest, I, I want his approval on my life. I don't want to give my life to him. So what is, what is, let's look at now at what John did. I love how uh, we, we see John as this burning and shining lamp. See, John's whole purpose was to point people to Jesus, to point Jesus to Messiah. And this word we find, this burning and shining lamp, it talks about a light that was kindled inside of John. It just didn't happen. Someone reached inside of John and ignited a flame in him. We all know who that person is, don't we? That's Jesus. In, a, in us, that's Jesus as well. It's the Holy Spirit. It's that burning in us that points to Jesus. And I got to remember, this, this, this sign of John the Baptist of pointing to Jesus. We like John, if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's a burning in you. There's a flame in you. you. You are called to witness. You are called to point to Jesus. And keeping in mind as we share truth and we share testimony by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're not responsible for the outcome. We are responsible, though, to be a burning light that shines to Jesus. We are also given the role to preach, proclaim, and testify about Jesus, regardless of how it is perceived. Because not everyone wants Jesus as Messiah. So as I'm walking through this, one of the first questions I, that came to my mind, and I want to share this with you, is there a burning flame in you? A flame that lights up the path to Jesus? When people see you and hang out with you, do they notice something different? Are you lighting up the path to Jesus? Do people hear you talk about Jesus? Do people hear you testify about Jesus? Because that's an incredible sign as we're traveling down the road. That sign says, John the Baptist pointed to Jesus. Friends and family here that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We are a sign too. And we get to be that sign that points to Jesus because we have that burning light in us. So... Let's keep, uh, let's downshift, or excuse me, let's upshift back up into the fourth and keep going to this next sign because we're all on our bikes right now tr traveling along and looking at the second sign. The second sign as we're driving down the highway is this, the supernatural works of Jesus. In John chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 36. Jesus says, but I have a greater testimony than John's because of the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I am doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. And Jesus has been loving on people, as we're reading in John, in supernatural ways. And it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, his first miracle was turning water into wine, which is awesome, unless you're a Baptist. And then you're like, whoa, whoa can't do that but then he but then he grows this last one can you imagine watching someone who couldn't even get off a mat watching tendons and muscles grow that he picks up his mat and walks why because God the father loved them and God says I'm going to show you my love by recreating flesh and bone that's amazing these supernatural works of God in Acts chapter 2 verse 22 we read this. 
again, the father's longing for Israel. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves now see. Now, if you've been with us for a while, you can see it next. We are continuing to want to learn more about the role of the Holy Spirit, the role of, of more of the supernatural that he wants to do here. We as elders have been wrestling and praying through this as staff and even as people where we want to walk more in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we're doing this, testimonies of healing and restoration are beginning to increase. And I want to share with you too, uh, before, I, if I would have read this passage in my youth and even in college, I was one of those guys that said, Jesus doesn't do this stuff anymore. I was a true hardened cessationist. In fact, when I went to seminary, I came out of seminary still making fun of people who walked in these. So I had a lot of repenting to do. But God in his goodness, when he started taking me overseas, he's like, Ryan, can I start showing you something? And then he brought me back and started expanding my comfort zone. So through a lot of his love and kindness and studying and surrounding myself with people that I loved and respected better, like, Ryan, can I show you what Jesus is doing in my life supernaturally, he began to change me. And I just wanted to share with you all the testimonies that are happening here at Next. God is still moving. Amen. Can I just share a couple with you already? Last night, I had a, a lady come up and wanted prayer. She goes, hey, uh, can you pray for me? I've been having pain in my hands for a long time. So uh, myself and two others in the prayer team prayed over her. And so it was awesome. Young couple, were just praying over her. And it's like, all right, God, yay, God, and let's go. But then the young man with me stopped her and said, hey, uh, how you feeling? And she took her hands out of ours and started going like this. And she said, the pain is gone. Yeah. And that's just one. There's more happening. Now, do we need to do that to prove Jesus' works? He doesn't have to do that. But what I want to encourage you with is Jesus is beginning to stretch our comfort zone with who he is. And when he wants to show up and love us in supernatural ways, let's not get in his way. Let's join him. So as we look over this, this sign of Jesus' works and miracles pointing to him, here's my question for you. Wherever you are in your journey with the Holy Spirit, are you bringing Jesus, the Bible, and most importantly, humility? Because Jesus is still doing supernatural works to love on people, to point people to him. And again, I'm asking you, wherever you are in your journey with these supernatural works, are you bringing the Holy Spirit, the scripture, and humility, because he is moving. It's awesome to see him move. It's a great sign, isn't it? All right, let's jump back on the highway now. The third sign that's coming up as we are pointing to Jesus. The third sign is this, the testimony of God, the Father. So if you're on a cruising bike, slow down a little bit. If you're on a, a speedster, a Jixer 1000, one you're not going to miss this. So slow down, Andrew, and read the sign. It says this. The testimonies of God the Father point to Jesus. Pretty cool. Jesus says this in verse 37. The Father who sent me has himself testified about me. You have not heard his voice at any time. By the way, you haven't seen his form. You don't have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. Again, Jesus is reasoning with them once again saying the Father himself says I am who I say that I am. The God of the Old Testament, the one you've been studying your whole life, who you've been memorizing since you were a teenager, that God, that Father, yeah, yeah, he's my dad. We are one. And they will not choose to believe this. Why? Because he is not matching their expectations. He is not matching living up to their theology. He is not living up to their expectations. And now Jesus 
begins to press in more on the heart motivations. And he says this, and it's very, very eye-opening. He says, you know what? You've been studying the scripture all your life, but you don't know his voice. You've never seen him, and his word is not in you. In fact, if you want to know his voice, it comes through me, Jesus, as Messiah. You want to see his form? It comes through me, Jesus, Messiah. And you want his word to reside in you? It, it comes through me, Jesus, Messiah. You see, this is still true for us today as it was in the Gospel of John. Through Jesus, we can know his voice. We will see his form, and his word can live in us. But the first step is confessing our sin and asking Jesus to forgive our sins and come to be our Lord and Savior. That's what Jesus offers. Now, for the sake of time, I'm just going to look at two of these briefly, knowing his voice and his word in you. Because that long, when we see him, that's going to happen one of two ways. Either when Jesus comes back or when we're with him in heaven. And oh, by the way, is, is, is anyone longing for that day to return sooner or later now? And I'm not talking just for political reasons. I'm talking about the brokenness of the world. The evil is increasing. I'm longing for that day to come. But I also want to encourage you, let's go back to the first sign. There's still a lot of loved ones that I know that need to know Jesus. I want to be that sign that's pointing people to Jesus. So my first question here is this, in this, in this uh, excuse me, in this sign of knowing Jesus. Do you know God's voice? Is his word living in you? How do you hear God's voice, right? It's one of, one of the things I get asked a lot. And this past uh, Tuesday when we did the, one of the Holy Spirit nights, and I uh, just thank God that Pastor Joe is just doing a tremendous job leading us through Scripture, leading us to truth, and being patient with, and pointing us to God. But one of the things he asked is, how many people hear God's voice? And I looked around, and I'm getting more and more encouraged by people that raise their hand. So I get this ask a lot, does God speak? And I'm going to say, absolutely, he speaks. Amen. Yeah, he does. What's his main way of speaking? Let's, let's go back to the scripture. How, how about that? When we come and say, Holy Spirit, speak to me through your word. You ever have those times in the word where you're just reading and things are popping off the pages? It could be encouragement. It, it could be some hope. It could be conviction. You know, that part of the Messiah we don't like. But he speaks. He speaks through his word. A lot of times I, I hear people, and this happens with me too, you ever get an impression when you're driving down the road or when you're sitting with God and he says, oh, by the way, I want you to, it's time for you to reach out to this person or that person. Yeah. I, I know a lot of people that get words uh, from God. You know, God wants to replace your fear with hope. He wants to replace your anger with love. It's happening I know sometimes people are get pictures from God. They, they show you pictures. And what are all these things doing? It's just God's way of loving and speaking on you. God speaks through worship. And not just song. I mean worship. I had the chance to go out to Colorado to spend Easter with my son uh, out at Fort Carson. And I've never been to Colorado. But when I walked and saw the mountains, I'm just like, there, you got to be kidding me. God, you did all this and yet you know me. There's, he's speaking. The, the question is, are you developing your ears to listen? My heart for next is that we continue to be a place where people no longer question, does God speak to me? We're going to be a place where we're going to be helping people hear his voice. That's awesome. So my question for you, do you know his voice? Are you spending time cultivating it, listening to it, and obeying it? Because your father will speak to you. And the amazing thing is when he speaks to you, his words are, are, are in here. It's, it's different than me giving you a word from God. When God speaks directly to you, it's like, wow, did he just speak to me? Yeah. Why? Because he loves you. So as God points to his son, said, this is my son. And you can know his voice and you can have his word in you. And then one day we will see him. We will see him. That, that time is coming. So let's move on to the uh, fourth sign as we're traveling down the road. 
Now, if you're on your motorcycle right now and if you're driving your Harley, it's a good time to check, to pull over and check for oil. Make sure your oil levels are up. Too, too soon, Keith? Too soon. This last sign that's pointing to Jesus is the Bible itself. In John chapter 5, verse 39, it says this. It says, you guys pour over the scripture because you think you will have eternal life in them. Yet they testify about me, but you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. Now, that's a sobering reality there. So you, you mean to tell me I, you can study the word, preach the word, memorize the word, know the Bible, and not have eternal life? Absolutely. 100%. These guys knew the Old Testament. But yet Messiah was right in front of them, and they said, no, thank you. See, how you approach the Bible, how you look at the Bible, how you interpret the Bible has a huge impact on whether you will or will not see Messiah. These guys came at the Bible looking at, they loved the Old Testament, they knew the Old Testament, they loved the law, but they got off track. They looked at the law to give life, and the law wasn't given to us to give life. The Ten Commandments, the Old Testament, were given to show us how, ready for this, sinful we are, how imperfect we are, how much we need a Savior. But these guys ran so much the other way, which let me memorize Scripture, let me gain more knowledge, let me create more traditions, that the further they went down that road, the further they got away from the point of Scripture. They didn't come to the Bible looking for Messiah, who he was revealed in the Word. They came more in tune, more confident, in their own traditions and what they were doing to gain eternal life. You see, there's, it's no different for us today. The lens we use and how we interpret the Bible will impact our view on Jesus. So maybe you're like me. When you come to the Bible sometimes, do you look at it like this, a collection of ancient stories? That's eh, just a book of stories. Maybe I'll read them, maybe I won't. I'm not too excited to sit down and read stories tonight. Or do you, do you look at it as a history book? It's like, I want to learn what happened back maybe around 1000 AD. Those stories are in there. It's a history book. But if you're not a history person, you're, you're not going to read a history book. Or maybe you come to the Bible as it's a, it's a book of moralistic lessons to help you how to be moralistic better, you know, be a better person. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to, does that sound encouraging to come to the Bible and spend time with the Bible, pointing to the Messiah? No. Or how about this? You ever come to the Bible looking at it as a driver's manual? I'm going to figure out where to go with my life here, go with my life there. It's just like, tell me how to drive. It's like, anybody here really enjoy reading manuals? Dads, when you put your kids' toys together, the first thing you get at is a manual, right? No, that's the first thing you throw away. Let's be real. Do you come to the Bible as a secret code book trying to figure it out? Oh, this word means this, this word means that. You add up these numbers here, subtract the four, add the five, it points to this day here. Great, now it's a code book. Or do you come looking at it sometimes as a list of do's and don'ts? One of my favorites. Great, I'm going to come to the Bible today and find out what else I'm not doing right. That sounds inviting, doesn't it? You see, how you look at the Bible, how you approach the Bible, if you come looking for Jesus, it will change your desire to be in the Bible. I like what James Boyce says. He says this, what is the primary purpose of Scripture? Is it to record the history of God's dealing with men? It does record such history, but that is not its primary function. It is to reveal truth to men. Although it does reveal truth, this is not the primary function either. The primary purpose of Scripture is to point men and women to Jesus. You see, the Bible is about a rescue story. It's about Jesus who came to deal with our sin, to rescue mankind from our sin through his birth, death, and resurrection. My question to you is this. When you open your Bible, are you coming to meet with Jesus so that you can know him, hear from him, be with him, and be loved by him. Here's how God taught me this one. When I first started my relationship with my wife, Michelle, back in 
the long, long days ago when there was a phone that hung on the wall and it was a cord attached to it. Um, that was how we got to know each other. The other way we got to know each other was we, we actually got out a pen and a paper and started writing. Uh, anybody write love letters when you were younger? See, when I was in college, I used to long for those letters from Michelle. As she would write those letters, as soon as I would check my mailbox, I'm all over them. I didn't care if I was studying for a test, didn't, know, didn't want to go work out, didn't want to go to the cafeteria. I sat down, ripped that letter open, and I read it. Not one time, but probably two or three times. And then I went out and came back and read that one again. What was going on in those letters? Those letters, I was learning about my, my bride-to-be. I got to know her heart. I got to know what she loved. I got to hear her dreams. I got to know what hurt her. I got to know what encouraged her. Those were letters. And what else did I do? We spent a lot of time on the phone. One of the most favorite things in my life that I have right now that it really brings joy to me is my wife's voice. I got to hear her voice. I could pick it out anywhere at any time. But I worked at it. It was intentional. And those are the visions, the illustrations I want to give to you all. Does that sound like a different lens to come to the Bible with? Hey, I get to meet with Jesus today. I get to experience his love, his forgiveness. I get to experience everything because you know what? I need Messiah, not just for eternal life, but I need Messiah as a Savior today. Now let's press on. This last sign as we're cruising down, this, this, this fifth sign is... Not so much a, a sign as it is flashing red lights. It's looking down at your motorcycle, your instrument panels, and all your lights are flashing. There's something wrong. There's danger coming up. And what is this danger uh, that God wants, what he's going to tell us about here? In verse 41, he says, I do not accept glory from people, but I know you do. You have no love for God within you. I have come in my Father's name, yet you don't accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe? Since you accept glory from one another, but don't seek the glory that comes only from God. Did you see the main hindering thing here? The religious people, these religious leaders are more consumed and more driven by what people think about them. We call this the fear of man or the applause of men. When you care more about what people think about you than what Father God says about you or what Messiah says about you. You see, they had no love for God because they don't value God. They don't value his love. They don't value his glory. What they value, what their glory is, is praise and respect and control. See, these are the guys who wore the brightest and best clothes when they would go out in public. These are the guys who wore the latest and greatest clothes out in public. When they walked around, they wanted people to notice them. And they noticed people noticing them. They liked that. They're like, oh, you're a religious leader. I can tell by your clothes. You're set off. You're apart. And they liked people noticing that they looked that way. These are also the guys that prayed so loud that people could hear them. They would walk into the temple or on the streets and pray these incredible prayers so that you and I would stand in awe and say, oh, one, they must be so close to God. Did you hear the way they prayed? That is awesome. They wanted that. They longed for that. That was their glory, that people would say, you're an incredible prayer, whatever that means. These guys memorized scripture and studied scripture. They knew, and they, they knew the word. And with that knowledge comes power because people would come to them and they would be the ones to instruct them. You can do this, you can't do that. Oh, listen to me. Why? Because I've been learning this since I was a child. And oh, by the way, can't you see the way I dress and how I pray? What else were these guys doing? These guys were the ones that made sure people did with their money in the temple. These are the guys that brought in their two-pound bag of coins in the box and made sure that it's quiet, and everybody's listening, and they dropped it in, and it made a loud thud. Unlike the, the woman over here that had a little, little coin and said, this is all I got. In fact, when I drop it in, no one's going to hear it. 
And lastly, these are the guys that would publicly state how much better they were because they weren't the worst of sinners. Does this resonate with you? So yeah, the approval and the applause of men was their God. And they did not need or desire to love God. There's no room for God when there's arrogance, pride, self-righteousness, control, and power on your throne. And that's sobering. I wanted to share with you also real quickly, uh, one of the new ministries we have is called Regen. And when you hear about regeneration, it's a 12-step biblically-based discipleship course. But if you're like me, you're like, oh, 12 steps, you think the three big ones, right? It's about alcohol, it's about substance abuse, and it's about porn, right? But I can tell you after almost five years now, you know what's itching its way, moving its way up to the top of the pile? The fear of man. Pride. Wanting to be accepted. I'm just like, so when I told you earlier I can relate to the religious leaders? Yeah, I can. And I think, church, we can too. But God in his goodness, says Messiah, can help you with that. So here's the flip side of that. You know when you humbly surrender and confess your sin and accept Messiah as the Bible says he is? You're rescued. You're rescued from your sin. You have eternal life. The love of God is in you. The word of God is in you. There's no judgment. You're accepted. You can know God's voice. You can have his word dwell in you. That's what we get when we accept Jesus as Messiah. I'm going to ask the, praise, uh, the worship team to come back up. And I want to ask you one more question. My last question. What do you desire more today? The glory and the praise from others? Or the glory that comes from choosing Jesus as Messiah? You see, when we look at Messiah... Let's just stop looking at Messiah as eternal life. We have a Savior for eternal life. We need a Savior every day. Every day. And you know what? He's there every day. So as these signs point to Jesus, I'm going to ask you this. Are you chasing the glory that comes from Jesus as Messiah? And as we close out this, this portion of the gospel... I want to invite you, don't leave here if the Holy Spirit's talking to you right now. We've started a, a prayer team ministry at the end of every um, service now. As we're standing in worship, and the, uh, come on up. Why? Because this is crucial. This is crucial. This is a time for you to deal with your sin, to deal with your pain, to deal with your hurt. A time to be healed, just not physically, mentally, emotionally, but spiritually as well. Come up. The Bible points to Jesus as our Savior, and we need a Savior every day. Let's pray. Jesus, I, I confess that your love for us is just unbelievable. And that your power for us as our Savior goes far deeper and wider than we ever thought. So today, Jesus, we give you our lives. We want to walk out of here saying, I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but you live in me, Jesus. That is how we want to worship you today on Mother's Day. Empower us today to do that. And we praise your name, Jesus. Amen.